Hello viewers, welcome back. This is Literary Goa, the program where we look at books and talk to authors who've done work on Goa. With me today is a special guest, Yvonne Vaz Esdani, also known as Yvonne Vaz. Uh, her book is called Songs of the Survivors. Actually, there are two books, Songs of the Survivors and New Songs of the Survivors. So, uh, many of you might have heard that uh, there was someone writing on the story of Goans in Burma and that is Yvonne. So, before Yvonne came along, most of us, all of us were not aware that there were so many Goans in Burma living a very active life there till the 40s, till the 60s and things like that. So, Yvonne, welcome to the show today and uh, nice to have you here. Uh, I said yours is a special book because uh, it was our first book with which we start published, with which we started publishing, but that's a different story for another day. Uh, you tell me what made you get into writing on this topic of Goans in Burma. Two books, not one. I wasn't a writer at that time, but I realized that not many people knew the stories of Burma Goans. They didn't, some of them didn't even know where was Burma. They used to ask me, what did y'all do in Burma? Did you live next to the Shwedagong Pagoda? And then I realized they didn't know anything of Burma or uh, about the war or anything that went on. Then I realized that there were so many stories about the escape from, during World War II, the Goans escaped from India, from Burma to India, and uh, they were living in India now, and only a few neighbors or friends knew their stories. They were not very uh, well known anywhere. One sec, and I just, just to interrupt, uh, when you talk about war, you're talking about World War II. World War II. When the Japanese invaded Burma. That was in 1941. Yeah. 41. 1941, Day. the Japanese invaded Burma, uh -huh. and uh, the Goans had to flee back to Virtually India. Virtually as, as refugees in that but sense. Yes, yeah. as refugees. And some of them got onto boats, some of them got onto the few last planes that were coming. But many of them had to walk across. And it was the rainy season and the hills and the rivers were swollen. They had to cross high mountains. And it was a very difficult trek. It's called the Great Trek. And like Amitav Ghosh said, it is also called the Long Forgotten March. The people who had to walk and march through those jungles are forgotten and no one has written about it. So I, I was telling my friends in Pune, I said, someone has to write about it. They said, why don't you? I said, I, I don't know. I didn't have the confidence enough to write. Anyway, I started collecting stories and I got this about This is about 10, 2005, 2007? 2005, 6, 7. Six. Yeah. So I started collecting stories and I remembered what my dad had told me about how difficult it was during the war and all that. So I said, people need to know about this in Goa. And uh, I started collecting stories, writing, writing them down with no idea whether I was going to make a book or not. And then I met Frederick Narona, who said, keep writing, we'll do it, we'll make a book of it. So that's how it began. Sometimes all these boasts come out of a lack of knowledge, because at that stage, even I wasn't into publishing and I had no uh, clear idea of how we would go about it. Yeah. But I'm glad that uh, your book came out as a series of stories. Yes. Oh. So that's how it happened. And uh, of course, Broadway, Broadway, the bookshop Broadway shop book helped. Shop helped Help Khaled, to fund yeah. and to fund and Khaled get the book helped out. Helped us a lot, and that uh, is true. and I think uh, we we were both careful about finding our way around it, but it turned it out right. Well. It, it turned well. out right. So I remember releasing this book on uh, somewhere in December, December, December two thousand seven. Two thousand seven. 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 Yeah. Seven. Yeah. It was at the Xavier Center because it was linked to yeah. history, and Mr. Edward yeah. Falero was there. Yeah and uh, things like he was the NRI uh, commissioner, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. So, so how did you go about it? You use the model, if I'm not mistaken, of talking to people, each of whom told you a chapter, gave you a chapter and told you their story. Yes. Who's in the book, for example? 
uh, for example, Thelma Manezes, who actually encouraged me to write the book. From Pune? Then my uncle, Peter Vaz, my aunt, Isa Vaz. <clears throat> they all had stories to tell. And as I was writing, I realized that it was not, not just about the war. It was also the story of migration, how their parents and grandparents had gone from Goa to Burma and established their lives there and did so well in Burma. And uh, that's how I saw that there was there were different layers to the story. Before before we get into that, I want to go back one step and talk about this big Vaz clan from Saligao. Uh, your uncles, your dad, your uncles, uh, a big family of six, seven brothers, something like that. Yeah. And uh, you can tell us more. And all of whom ended up in Burma. So tell us about the, ba the Vaz family and, uh, you know, which parts of Burma they went to. A lot of them were engineers, very skilled people. I remember, you know, the same time we came back from Brazil, they came back from Burma. It was about the 60s and things like that. So tell us about their, their family. It was my great-grandfather, Santan Salvador Vaz, who went first to Burma, but we don't know much about him. Which year? In the 1980, uh, it must have been about 1850 or so because my grandfather was about 14 years old when he went. And the story that I know is about my grandfather because we, we knew him, we met him every year. And uh, he went alone. He came back, married my grandmother and took her there. And they had seven sons and one daughter. My dad was the eldest. So that was the family they, he established there. In and Burma. This in is, Burma. This in Taungji, in the Shan states of Burma. That's in the that's south? That's in the uh, north. eastern, uh, eastern I'm getting it part of wrong. Burma. It's on the Thai, near the Thailand Thai border. border. And, uh, this is now, this is, this is maybe 1910s where your dad was born? My dad was born in 1913. 13. Yeah. So then uh, my, uh, the family was established there and uh, Somehow the Goans in Burma were doing very well. I think it's because they could speak English. They got along with, well with the British, who were their masters. And uh, they established themselves in different fields, which I think they never would have done in Goa. Of course. Yeah. Of like course. my grandfather, he became the draftsman in the PWD. And, and a lot of your uncles were engineers also. And no? after that, my uncles and all, they went to GTI and to what the technical, government technical institute. And uh, my father and also my f four other uncles all joined the PWD and became... Then and here in Goa also, they, some of them. Yeah, and they became what is known as STOs. STOs are subdivisional officers. They became officers, senior which post, is quite, post, yeah, quite, quite a high. But uh, even just to go back one step, uh, Burma was almost a part of India in those days administratively. At least you could travel there without visas, passports, nothing. Right? I don't think so. I, it, I think uh, it was uh, earlier that that was the case. Under the but, British? Yeah. But I remember the, my grandfather having to change his visa from Portuguese visa, uh, passport. passport to Indian passport. I remember that time. And then uh, my father and all, they had to apply for visas to come to India. To so, come to India? Okay. So, okay. so it was not like going to Bombay, Bangalore, Karachi or say, Calcutta or something no. like that. It was, it, was a, it was a different... It was a different country. country. And, yeah. Interesting. And uh, I don't really know the, the, the political uh, so connections between. But to go from the small to the large, uh, how big was the Goan community there? more or less? Uh, where we were living, I think it was just the Vaz family. But in Rangoon, there were a lot of Goans in different fields of week. But most of them were there during, uh, before the war. During the war, they left. And after the war, very few families were left. Okay. I think maybe about 50 families in Rangoon after the war. I see. Before that, there must have been at least three or four hundred families. Yeah. And uh, maybe more even. You've but described bakeries, Goan bakeries, mm. you've described other businesses, you've music, described people. Music. music. That's why I called 
I named it Songs of the Survivors because yeah. so many of them were musicians and they established themselves as famous musicians. They opened music schools, music shops. Music shops. Yeah. That's many, typical of Goans, no? all, over, of them, all over the place. Yeah. Even in, in Singapore, Malaya, they had yeah. music shops. And, yeah. and uh, there was a lot of, uh, maybe there were other other careers that they went into too. But many of them rose to a high position, like A.J. de Cruz. He became uh, one of the top uh, in the administrative, British administrative system. I see. And uh, then there were others like uh, Thelma Menezes' family and all. They were all teachers and uh, they did they did well they, for themselves they but, thought but 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 they were educated price. they they educated the second generation yeah, very well very yeah. well so although they went there was one who told me that he had no education at all he used to work with his aunt in the fields I in see. goa i see and he went there and he became a station master wow yeah and he wow. became quite rich too because he had a lot of a big farm and so yeah. in a way this is a story of goan migration Yvonne, isn't it that uh, goans leave their home they go elsewhere they do well but doing well also comes with a price often it's like you get uprooted from your own home and you have to fight to get back your houses and in your case there was this trauma of becoming refugees almost twice in the 40s when the japanese invaded and then uh, the vases went back to burma many of them they didn't go back they were there all the time they okay. couldn't escape my family, uh, they missed the last flight to India and because the airport was bombed. So, and they couldn't walk across because of many sick people okay. and all that. So, they lived in Burma during, during the, the Japanese war. occupation. Okay. Japanese occupation. But, but some of your uncles and all came back or no? They came back in 1960. Okay. But Okay, so your not. family stayed on, stayed on through the war, mm -hmm. but uh, you all got, you all got affected twice during yes. the forty-two bombing yeah. and the uh, Japanese invasion, and in sixties during yeah. this Nevin and the Burmese road yes. to socialism and yes. all that, where where the country closed its doors, uh, in a very dramatic sense. And uh, you mentioned in your book also that even if you were educated there, you had to pay to leave the country because yes. they considered that they are educated. Yes. Tell us, tell us about what life was, how it changed after independence. Uh, while independence meant good for many people, it also unsettled others. So tell us about that. After independence, there was a very peaceful era and uh, there was plenty. Uh, what I remember about Burma is the abundance. There was plenty of food, there was plenty of uh, good things in life, material things, as well as there was an abundance of love and kindness. Someone That's what I it, remember. Someone called it a land of milk and honey. I think that was, was that was your auntie Isa, uh, your it, our neighbor. It was. We never lacked anything, and we were very happy there. And the people were very nice, kind, polite, uh, kind. Polite. Got on the well. Got Buddhist, on well. The Buddhist ambience. Uh, yeah, there was wealth, but even if they didn't have wealth, there was no. Got never on, got on well. Got on well. I mean, got on well got with, on with well the Goan with communities. People. Goans were not yeah. seen as exploiters, and you know. No, no. Yeah. And uh, the people, the Buddhist people, are very tolerant, accepting of everyone, have that compassion. I see. So there were no conflicts with people there, and uh, that that created the, all the happiness and the joy in our lives. But it changed in the sixties. In the sixties, the people didn't change. Yeah. It was the government that changed, and uh, there was a lot of economic hardships because everything was nationalized and taken over. A lot of foreigners were left the country because there were very harsh rules regarding foreigners and it's, staying it's in Burma. And it's very sad that Burma is still going through tough times, you know, uh, despite of all yeah. the hopes and on yeah. San Suu Kyi and, you know, it's, it's still... It's, it's getting still, even worse, I think. At worse. least there was no violence during our time okay. while we were there. Okay. It was just that the economy was bad. really very bad. And uh, there was not enough, I mean, we, did, we couldn't get enough of what we wanted materially. Yeah. And uh, not military only rule, that, Military whole, rule and things like that came whole, in later, came in later. Yeah, a lot of rules, a lot of spying on people and all that. You so came in there the was 80s, no freedom. you ultimately came in the 80s? Yeah. That was late, We no? were the last family to come. Really? And uh, 
all my other uncles and aunts came in the ni in 1960s, but my dad came in 1980 and yeah. we came in 1982. Okay, so. we leave the politics aside for the moment, but we since we are talking about books, let's get back to that. Your first book touches on Goans in Burma, Goans in Burma, and then uh, I feel almost proud to say that uh, others in the rest of the country realized that there was no book on Indians in Burma. So you went about doing this book. I got a few more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So tell us about this book and and uh, and and uh, you know uh, what was your your. I mean, like it's 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 a matter of pride that someone from Goa is is reminding the rest of the country that you had a community there also. I think prominent uh, Indians like uh, Prakash Prakash Karat's family, uh, one of the CPM leaders, no? Uh, who was that? Uh, I'm from Orissa. Uh, one one of the CPM leader yeah. families were in Burma. Jerry Pinto's family was in Burma. Yeah, Jerry Pinto's family was there. The writer Jerry yeah. Pinto. So so uh, tell us what you found in your second book while doing your second book. Uh, actually, the second book was more about putting all the stories together and narrating as as one, not not separate stories. But then I got a few friends from Tamil Nadu who said they wrote, they read my book, and they too had a story to tell. Wow. So I said, if you can give me more stories, I'll add them. We put other voices because we said these are Goan voices first, and then make it wider. We made it wider. We put other voices. So I got also Helen, Helen the dancer, the actress. Helen, Helen. Yeah. Jerry Pinto. Wrote yeah, Jerry. About her. Jerry Pinto discovered and wrote about her Burmese roots, yes. and uh, yeah. she features in, in in this book also. Helen. Yes. Yeah. So what, Helen is part Burmese. Jerry? Helen is part Burmese, Anglo Burmese. Uh, Anglo Burmese, I think. I I'm not sure. I had a, but she was very young when they, when, when they walked came. across. Yeah. And she became a big name in Bollywood. Uh, yeah. Probably. But she doesn't like to talk about it much. Maybe. But Jerry somehow got something, and uh, that's how we got it. And uh, then there was another lady who had written already written a book, and sh her daughter gave me the story. I see Shakuntala's story. If you read in the book Shakuntala's story, I see it's uh, very interesting because uh, you know it's different from the Goan. Uh, stories, yeah. yeah. But what is fascinating is that you are sitting in this tiny part of India called Goa, and you are writing, discovering something for the rest of the country. I think it was meant to be. I just feel that these books were meant to uh, be written, yeah. Yeah. and I happen to be the one to write it, and because no one else was doing it. <laughs> anyway, so now that you've written two books, I think the virus and the bug has caught you completely. You're writing a third, which is your autobiography. Tell us about that. Actually, I, uh, my daughter told me, write, write something about Burma and Goa and about your lives there for, the grand, for my grandchildren. So I said, okay. She said, there's nobody to tell them those stories. You write about it. They're still small, but they're so growing up. They're, they're still small. And twelve, and, ten, twelve, and uh, <clears throat> so I, I began to write for them actually. Yeah. And as I was writing, I I felt I I was remembering things that I thought I had forgotten, and uh, it was going into a deeper part of me, and the writing was coming out in a different way than I had planned it. Yeah. So, I. I showed it to Jerry Pinto. He said it would make a good book. Just keep writing till you reach so many words. Yeah. Otherwise, I would have stopped, you know, yeah. with a little bit. So I kept writing, and then I kept editing. I gave it to someone to read. They said it's good. Can make a book of it. So. When you when you when you're leading life, it all looks like small disparate things coming together. But when you look back at it, you realize there's a pattern. You realize there's an interesting story. Almost everyone has a story. I'm I'm not saying everyone, but uh, those who remember it, those who think deeply about it, those who can piece it together, like you have done. So here is you coming back from uh, Burma to Goa in the 80s, uh, struggling, leading quite a tough life. Uh, taking up a job, teaching teaching English at the high secondary level and things like that. Uh, there's an interesting love story woven into <laughs> into into. I thought that was very dramatic. I I was <laughs> reading it at three four o'clock in the morning and I couldn't put it down. You want to say a word on that? That was in Burma. Yeah. I, uh, in Kalaw. Kalaw is a very romantic place. So. This is outside Rangoon. 
No, it's in the Shan state. In the Shan state. Yeah, it's in the Shan state. And uh, he was my neighbor, became my husband later. And we went for a walk and realized that we were, it began there and realized that we were in love with each other. Didn't I didn't know that before. But uh, it gradually grew. And uh, for seven years, we were together as girlfriend and boyfriend. And then we got married, although the parents did not on agree. On both sides, on both sides. In the beginning, there was parental opposition. But later on, everyone was OK with it. And we get along very well together. We are a close family. So you've yeah. cut off. You've cut off the most interesting parts. But I'm not going to be a plot spoiler and tell it to the reader. I'll make them make them read your book, so that because there's a lot of drama that comes into into this story also. But I thought it was fascinating. And then uh, why why don't people read my book? Then? Yes, <laughs> correct, correct. And at the same time, then adjusting in Goa is not easy, right? In the uh, 80s. Adjusting. It was very hard because my husband went off to try and earn something in the Gulf, didn't get a job for a long time. And then we we couldn't bring anything from Burma. We came you were as not refugees. allowed to take out anything? No, we were allowed $11 each. My husband $11 and I, yeah. me $11. And someone, and threatening, you, gold. someone threatening you at the airport? At the airport, uh, trying to get money. <laughs> that was a funny thing. And uh, we, we, did, we couldn't bring much. And the suitcase, one suitcase uh, of clothes, nothing for the children, no extra baggage for the children at all. So my two girls were young at that time. So we came with hardly nothing and hardly anything. And uh, I'm so grateful that I have many cousins, aunts and uncles, and especially my father and my brothers who were here. They really helped us. You've, you've told your story so nicely uh, and in the book it reads even better because there's scope for much more details here. We are forced to, you know, the tyranny of time. Uh, one last question. Tell us what it is like to write your mem memoirs and why people should do it, why you feel it's important, assuming you do. It, Like I told you, it brought out the deeper layers in me and some things I thought I had forgotten. But they were there within me and they came out later and I was able to look at it in new light, you know, s understand what happened earlier. And it was interesting to me. My own life became interesting to me. Even the difficulties and the hardships and all, I saw how I got through them. That's a nice way and, of putting it. And uh, I, I sort of uh, wanted to write about it. It was very, it was like a catharsis. I, I felt good after writing it. And I think You're leaving this for your grandchildren also. I wrote it actually for my grandchildren, but now we're making it in a book. So I hope many people will read it. And pick uh, up some lessons from that. You're always very optimistic. I no? learned a lot of lessons from my life. So I've shared that in my book too. Actually, uh, there is a lot I've learned about relationships with people and uh, how how to get through certain situations and all that. So that's what I wrote about. Some people may think it's too philosophical, but I, think I couldn't it's nice. help that. I, I think it's it's well written. It's very simply put, you know, you're not standing there and preaching and things like that. So it's, it's, it flows really well. But are you also saying that anyone who thinks deeply can write about their own life and, and share some lessons from it? I think so. I think so. I was I was going to advise people to try and write their li stories, write it from the heart. Whatever, whatever you feel comes, you just write it. Don't censor because, yourself. Because yeah, and then later the first draft should be from the heart, and after that you edit it or yeah. you ask someone to read it or whatever. And especially if you want to make it into a book, then you need help uh, in editing or whatever. Mm. But I think. The first draft has to come from the heart and it has to just flow and uh, because there's so much in our lives, like I told you, there's so much in our lives that sometimes is even hidden from us. That's true. And it, it reveals itself as you are doing the writing. And I think everyone has an interesting story to tell, 
each one's life is unique. The people you meet, the encounters, and there's uh, something special about everything. That's yeah, that's so true. It that's is. So true. It is. Yeah. Even I'm so grateful for these two books because I enjoyed uh, the knowledge that you put across. I'm waiting for the third. And I'm not going to ask you what's coming after that, but I hope that there will be many more and keep writing, keep it up, all the best. Thank you so I much. I like writing short articles too. I think I'll go in more into that. You were threatening to write for children, but uh, then <laughs> the, your ch grandchildren are young enough to do that. <laughs> no, I don't think I will write about ch for children. <laughs> You're not going to compete with our friend Anita Pinto. <laughs> <laughs> Anita is too good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me and letting me talk about my books A pleasure. and Real my pleasure. life. Real pleasure. My life and my books are tied up, so I had to talk about both of them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.